Vandana, uh, before we get into our discussion about education and teacher education, your role, your ideas, let's hear about yourself and uh, how you came to be here. All right, that's interesting, Amukta, because um, very difficult to introduce your own self. Uh, you don't know how to talk about your own self. Uh, but yeah, starting from the basics, you know, I'm, I'm something like five decades old, little more than that. And um, I work as a teacher educator in Delhi University. Um, I work with an institution which had a tag of being the premier institution in Asia. We came up in 1947. But in 2023, we are trying to justify it further, you know, that we retain the tag and we continue with that kind of legacy, you know. So that's a struggle. We'll talk more about it when we get on to it. Uh, so primarily that, I come from, um, I'm, I'm, I have certain core values from the discipline of physics because I done a master's in physics and then I moved over to education. So quite multidisciplinary in my approach by itself, you know, because yeah. you've been through those things and... Yeah, I think more when we get on to yeah. things, yeah. <laughs> and you recently became a professor. Ah, uh, okay, yeah, I became a professor some, okay, recently, yeah. Two years. Uh, more than that, but that's okay. Uh, that's not important. The years are not important. Um, yeah, I became a professor recently. Uh, 22, 23, I was on a Fulbright Fellowship. So I went to this very amazing place in USA, which is Mississippi. So come back with a lot of enriched narratives. Mm -hmm. I was situated at Mississippi Valley State University in Etabina, the university uh, campus, which is surrounded by cotton fields mm -hmm. from all over the place. Uh, yeah, that was another amazing experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For your focus on diversity, I'm sure it was interesting to be in Mississippi rather than any other <laughs> kind of a central university. In there. Absolutely so. I'll, I'll so agree with that, you know, because uh, uh, the kind of insights I've got into the community structures, uh, little bit of their political structures also, and more in the educational structures that have given me a kind of, you know, uh, it has helped me create that vastness in the discourse on diversity and inclusion. Uh, we do understand that there are context specific things which we need to address. But we also understand that there are certain generic ideas, you know, that we have to talk about mm -hmm. when we talk about diversity and inclusion and, and things like that. So, yeah, definitely it has been a very significant mm -hmm. um, aspect of my learning. And I think it is going to add more to my way of thinking as I grow further. So, This area of diversity, why do you think that's important and why did you focus on it for the last many years? So, um, see, it, it did not start from diversity. Let's, let's just yeah. um, start. I'll, I'll give you a little bit of background and then we can probably have understand, you know, that how diversity was not the point of uh, the, the, the beginning point, but how it was a point where I arrived at. So diversity is more of a point of arrival for me mm -hmm. and not something which I started with here. So, you know, 91, 92, I was a BA student, Bachelor of mm -hmm. Education. I just came out from my um, master's program in PhD, um, a master's program in physics. And then um, I was doing this small project in nuclear physics uh, at JNU. We have this reactor and all that. There's nuclear science center there. And I was very sure, you know, that I'm going to get into research in nuclear science because that's, that's where the heart lies, you know. And then suddenly I gave this exam. I had no... Like when I say this, uh, my students are like, uh, can't be true, but it's it really, this is how it happened, you know. So this happened and then uh, the beard entrance happened. Um, so I went to my professor, the physics professor, very hesitantly and I told him that this is where I am right now, what do I do? And I think more than my family, my professor was excited because he knew about the institution probably or things like that. So he said that you've gone into a very great place. You must go there. It's just a nine months course and you just finish it and then you can come back to it. You know, so it will give you a different kind of orientation and stuff like that. So I went for the course and, you know, during this course, something amazing happened. Um, so from 11th grade onwards, that was around two years of 11th and 12th. 
three years of your bachelor's program physics honors and two years of your this thing almost seven years you know you have not had a time where you can talk in the classroom because physics is a very loaded kind of a content it's everything is pre-decided outside the classroom and and there is no scope for negotiation so for somebody like me who has been a debater in the early years and things like that it was good but you know there was this kind of a urge to be able to speak in the classroom to be able to talk to be able to do that and i think beard classroom gave me that opportunity and i was back in that kind of a mode where you can have conversations and you can do things like that so the idea of the meaningful presence of student in a classroom i think that started from that point when I entered that institution and I started looking forward to when your teachers uh, you know they're they're pointing out to you and they're saying okay do you have a point of view on this whereas earlier the teacher would only say are you listening to me you know <laughs> they drop a chalk and say are you listening to me and there is a person who is asking you that do you have any do you want to say something about this and and they'll they'll coolly wait for you to get into that zone and, and they were not desperate and they were not in a hurry. So in I think BH. in the BA program when I was a student here. So that was quite a kind of a change for us, for me actually. And that's how it all started. And then I had this wonderful professor, Professor Krishna Moitra, with whom I uh, finally did my PhD research also. She was teaching educational psychology and she was working in the field of gifted at that moment. Uh, she came to the classroom and she had to do this session on gifted students with us. So she's talking about high ability, whatever, you know, there's a discourse on gifted. I don't want to go into the details of that. But then she came up with a very interesting concept of gifted underachiever. Okay, where she started saying that these are the people whom, you know, the world doesn't understand. So they don't score and they don't do well. Uh, but but when they don't do well, the children who are not doing well, we got to be sitting with them. We got to be finding out. They may just not be uh, finding any essence in the classroom. They may just be the classroom may be just very basic for them and stuff like that. And that's where I'm thinking. I said, okay, that's why I never got marks in my, all my career. I was such an average scorer. So I started identifying myself as a gifted underachiever. You know. But what happened during that program is that we realized that children are not different. We also realized that when they are not performing, it is not their own fault. And these are the kind of, you know, ideas which we started getting into, which became more matured as we moved into the discipline and we worked through that. Uh, so when you asked me about diversity, why was it important for me to mention this? It's because these are my point of initiations into the world of education. Then I did my master's in education and when I went back to my professor during my B.A. program, I was giving him all these kind of narratives and one day he suddenly said that, one well, then I know you're not coming back to physics. <laughs> so I think that's how the, the people with an experience will kind of come up with that. But yeah, then I never went, went back to physics in that way. So then I did my M.Ed. In M.Ed. I did my dissertation in an interdisciplinary manner which was gifted students in physics classroom. But how do I bring that gifted discourse to every child in the classroom? So typically in a gifted discourse, they were creating pockets of excellence. Here we thought that we want to talk about an every child kind of a context and we did that. So I did that dissertation which was actually appreciated uh, thanks to my teachers. Uh, then I came over to, uh, then we had this conference in 97 which was an international conference on gifted uh, where this person had come over. Mr. Enzuli, whose model I used in my dissertation and, and you know he was standing, I just showed him that I used your model and tried to, he was just standing with the entire thing, he flipped over and he was like that, I never thought that this can actually be done with every child. So you know those kind of ideas when we kind of contextualize them and when we try to look them in our own context that becomes important. So my journey started with a very specific group of children discussing about them but bringing that discourse for the learning. Uh, uh, for the learning uh, graph of every child in the classroom is how I kind of started working. I was already working as a teacher after finishing up with that. I taught, uh, I was a science teacher. I taught classes 6 from 10th in uh, Balbhati Public School, one of the uh, private schools in Delhi. 
uh, and after that I came as a as a teacher here as a, as a faculty member in university now that that entire idea again you know because uh, the idea of disabilities was getting uh, recognized in the field of education uh, 95 we had this PWD act so you know we had a teacher preparation program and because I was in that field I got associated with that I was so we had this institution affiliated to our university where diploma course for visual impairment was going on which subsequently became a B.A. program in visual impairment so we went as a team to that place I went with my senior teachers as a team to that place uh, we have been doing this lesson observations, the, the trainees goes to the field and then we go, we have discussions on their lessons and things like that. And there is a very typical mindset with which you go there. So I go to this class, which is where all the students are visually impaired. I go to this class, I sit behind like we always do. I look up and I don't see a blackboard there. Okay, so my first impression is that, oh, this classroom doesn't have a blackboard. And drop down within fraction of seconds i'm like there is no need for a blackboard okay so when we get, when you have these kind of experiences you understand the multiplicity of context more you, you you so i was getting those kind of exposures time and again but as i got into my classroom further i realized that it's not the person's own situation or own experiences but there are a lot of external factors which are playing a part in it you know the social factor social factors like your gender your caste your class your uh, your your, dis your resourcefulness you know which is not your own but which is created by outside factors so realize that social factors create a very significant part in you coming up learning your learning curves because every time my my focus even now is the learning curve of curve of your student how do you kind of you know mobilize it and escalate it and take it ahead so you realize that even those external factors are very important and they play a very critical role. You go further in your education years and you realize that social factors have a very, you know, cultural and a very political impact. So you try to, you know, your, your, your focus is bastioning like this. You start from gift trade, you go to this, this, this. And every time you're realizing that there is more to it, there is more to it, there is more to it. And that is when, when I said that my Fulbright Fellowship has added, there is more to it, there is more to it, you know. So, so these kind of experiences were going ahead. And there was a constant struggle that how do, if I want to do uh, something as a teacher, what should I do? And that was always a question that what should I do as a teacher? And that is where I realized that there has, I came up with two terms, you know, one is exclusion and other was diversity. So for me, diversity is a concept. Diversity is not something, it is being used in a very fancy manner now. We all know that everywhere, everybody is talking about diversity, inclusion, diversity, inclusion. I mean, like, it's just a very casual kind of a reference, but uh, this time, even in TV shows, we say that, you know, in the name of diversity and inclusion, and it is being spoken about. I'm not, uh, I'm not saying something against that, but what I'm trying to say is that it has become a kind of a word which everybody wants to talk about, a like a tagline, and like something like a promotional core value of an institution or of, an, uh, of a profession, something like that. So, that is... These are the two points where I arrived at and then I had to now think about these things that we want inclusion, okay. We want inclusion of people. How as a teacher should I approach it? That was my conflict, that was my struggle. If I talk about exclusion, if I have a lot of narratives about exclusion, which is present and I don't deny the process of exclusion. There is a systematic process of exclusion which has happened and which has happened across all groups of people for different reasons, different factors and things like that. So exclusion as a phenomena cannot be ignored, it cannot be denied, it's there. So should the approach be based on exclusion because certain people were excluded, certain situations were excluded and we have to make an effort to include it. That was one idea which could have come up. 
there was another idea where we could have spoken about inclusion from contesting the idea of inclusion by itself supposing what does that mean supposing i say school okay so when i def when i talk about a school and i say certain children are out of school so what should be my idea should i get all the children in the school or should i expand the boundaries of school you know so if i try if i work on first approach that i get all the children in school my methodology my 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 style would be different but if i work on this concept that i extend the boundaries of school that meant something else and that is where the idea of diversity come in so when we are talking about inclusion whether i want to undo all those reasons for which the person or community or abc was excluded or do i work upon the concept of inclusion itself which has been so exclusive for many people for many situation in the in the institutions itself absolutely because i work in an institution so my approach is primarily institutionalized i look at institutions being more open institutions being more diverse in their approach and things like that so that is where i had to kind of you know um, uh justify my uh, my idea where i said that if you say these are the five abilities which a child should have but the child says that i have 10 other abilities which are not these five so should we make the child acquire those five abilities which include the child or should i change the list of abilities and say that these are the 15 abilities and the children having all these abilities are called as you know learned people if i want to use that word in the institutional kind of an idea so i think that is where i thought focusing on diversity is what we require to do it because education should enhance people's condition they should not ask for change in people's condition a lot of things which will be left behind uh, the cultural rootedness that we have within ourselves i am a great supporter of that maybe it's my personal kind of a value system but i think you have to be rooted and 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 it doesn't work even in plants it doesn't work that they're rooted somewhere else you uproot them you root them in some other soil they won't flourish like that so i think that was my idea that so starting with in a sense of acceptance of you know of different uh, differences and then accepting in a sense then it's a then a bringing in no once you accept it yeah. otherwise if you reject it and say only we want only this then that doesn't happen that's right but you have to allow me to change this word acceptance yeah. uh, because that's also a little hegemonic that i accept you mm. which means there is still a lot of i and you so acknowledging is a word which i would like to use instead of accepting acknowledging that people are different acknowledging that difference is is natural difference is organic and let's just learn how to uh, how to be with different people around us how to be respectful with be, with different people around us i think that's the core yeah. lovely lovely to hear you <laughs> what do you think uh, has happened in the institutions that you were that you have been in over the years if this idea of not only diversity but also adding inclusion into it and respect for the other how has all that been brought into some of the institutions or in people or in the programs yeah so sure, i think institutions institutions by self are a very static and there is an inherent inertia within the institution and this idea of you know what to carry forward and what to change is always a kind of a challenge because different people are thinking about it at a different point of time so if something was set up in 1915 the institution and if i'm thinking in 19 say 85 what to retain and what to change i think this is a different set of people who don't conceptualize who don't foresee the same way so that idea by itself is a very flawed idea according to me if i am allowed to use that word 
how do you develop those kind of critical insights where we are able to see institution vis-a-vis -vis the surroundings, the contemporization, the context. context. That is important for us. I remember my institution in 91 to 93, I was there as a B.A. level student, being heavily loaded with girls. There were little boys onto that. We were doing teacher preparation for secondary uh, school. Uh, then, you know, 95 the commission came, the pay commission came. And the pay commission gave a lot of uh, significant uh, um, increase in the emoluments of the teachers. They did a lot of uh, things for teachers economically. So, 96, 97, when I go to my institution, I see a lot of boys there also. Right? So, these kind of factors, even if I wanted to change the social demography of the institution in, say, uh, 1980, 1990, it would not have happened. Because how do you attract people in, in terms of that? There is nothing which, can, which you can go and influence the community with. So, these kind of junctures, you know, they really make the things very, very different. When the entire, I don't remember throughout my school, I have, I am from a public school system. I have studied in government schools of Delhi. I have not seen any child with visual impairment in my school. I am talking about 70s and 80s, you know. 1986, I passed out from school, from grade 12th. I don't see any visual impaired child. I go to BA, very few. My physics honors, nobody with visual impairment I can see in my classroom. MSc physics, I don't see any visual impairment child, impaired person. Now, when I come to, you know, come 1995 policy, then the adaptation of it. Uh, we had, you know, students coming from uh, different backgrounds, mm -hmm. visual impairment being one of the most uh, uh, rapidly added uh, kind of, a, you know, segment of people. Uh, because the group was very active, the, the group which was mobilizing the education and rights of uh, people with visual impairment has been very active. So, I think that is something which brought them into the system uh, once. So, another, you know, the juncture comes in where the teachers now have to uh, kind of prepare themselves to have visual impaired uh, students in the classroom. So, I think these are the kind of things which happen due to policy and then, you know, people keep dropping in. Um, and the, the social configuration keeps on changing and every time you have to adapt to that configuration, you have to learn to that, uh, do certain different things in the classroom and things like that. So, we are a central university and uh, uh, we have people coming over from all the place. Once in physics class, I had this international student who would not understand Hindi and I had a group of students from Rajasthan who would not understand English and there were others, you know, who were partly bilingual Hindi English they were able to manage. So, I mean that class became the most interesting session for me for that particular year, you know, because uh, how we evolved a mechanism of peer tutoring where, you know, everyone took the responsibility that whatever is happening in the class. So, Vandana is going to be speaking in Hindi or English or bilingual, but she can't do everything in Hindi also and in English also. So, this, these students of mine, they took that responsibility and they started kind of, you know, uh, ensuring that everyone understands every point that has been spoken in the classroom. So, I think these are the kind of things which help you understand that this is a possibility to create, uh, you know, a change of thought with people, with practice of course. And with experience, I also want to say this that um, it's easy to work with students no matter what age group is and it's very difficult to work with your colleagues. And it's extremely impossible to work with your senior colleagues <laughs> who have been your teachers at one point in time, you know, they, they're just still thinking of you in that, in that kid's zone and they were like, okay, yeah, okay, you have an idea, we are happy to know your idea. Very interesting teachers, very uh, inclusive teachers, but still, you know, they're like, uh, uh, not hierarchy, that kind of idea, you know, okay, so you're fresh, you're Patronize. coming up with this idea, you, yeah, you're coming up with this idea, you, you stay here for five years and you'll understand it doesn't work, you know, those kind of things that your thing will go away. But I stayed there for 25 years and I have lots of things that worked mm -hmm. in the system, you know, uh, that involved uh, making courses. So, 97, I joined. The first thing which I did in 20, uh, uh, 2003 was change the courses, all the science courses with how, the post. How, how did that happen? 
that was that was an interesting episode you know because i went to my head and i said this needs to be changed and the head was like you really think so i said no i don't think so you look at the syllabus do you want this to be changed and he said yes it should be changed so you know uh, physics or the i was teaching physics i said i want to change physics and then there were people in chemistry and biology and all over the place i just had to go around and speak with them you know these are the teachers who have supervised my classes when i was a student and things like that but i found a positive kind of a you know association with the science fraternity so we did that kind of a change we we actually changed the entire course the entire perspective with people dropping in collaborating and we did that and once we did that kind of an exercise it did become an example for others also because they were saying that okay to teach this course we have to work differently now it can't be done with the same approach so can you give some examples of what change you brought in into the course into the curriculum 